United States that has his same set of credentials. I could be wrong. I don't think there is. Dr. Singh has worked very hard to distinguish himself. He's one of the smartest guys that I know. So you guys listen in, buckle up and enjoy. Thanks for being here today. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Ford. Uh, we're going to start with this. I mean, I think this is a very, very fascinating lecture just because I always say that if you own your own practice or you intend to own your own practice at some point, you will distinguish yourself from other folks when you treat stuff which other people are not treating. The stuff which other people are missing and you start treating them, then you will probably be able to distinguish yourself from your competitors from the market or from because at some at one point we all want to be successful at what we do right so and this is that's why this diagnosis is very very important just because this diagnosis is not talked about much there is very very little literature about this diagnosis but you will always find patients who have who come under spectrum of the disorders that Magnus, Magnus syndrome brings in. So we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the basics of Magnus syndrome. So Robert Magne, just a little background about Robert Magne, was an orthopedic, orthopedic doc. He diagnosed it or found this in 1970s where he, a lot of patients with back pain had origin from thoracolumbar junction. So, you guys mute yourself. This is a very, very interesting picture. And just, I mean, this is a stuff nobody teaches. Uh, you guys muting yourself. All right, everybody that's tuning in, if you guys can please mute yourselves. Everyone that's tuning in, please mute yourselves. Please mute yourselves. I mean, I just think as the host, I think you can mute everybody and then unmute yourself. Yep. So, Dr. Singh, as the host, can you mute everybody and then unmute uh, yourself? As the host, uh, Dr. Zumi, do you mind muting everybody? There's some disturbance still. Thank you. Okay, so talking about this diagnosis, the first important point is poorly understood. So Robert Magnet did a lot of work and he, he, according to him, the first, I think the first publication was back in 1980, where he found that 40% of patients, and he took a sample size of 350 people, according to him, 40% of patients had some form of thoracolumbar involvement. Okay. The interesting thing is symptoms from thoracolumbar junction can radiate anywhere in the body. It can go to the low back pelvis, hip, lower abdomen, and groin. And that's why it can get confused with everything else, just because the wide variety of pain areas. More, more information about T12L1. Why is it going in dysfunction? If you look at the literature, it talks about more range of motion, more translatory and rotatory motion at T12L1. Okay. If you know your basic biomechanics, your thora thoracic facets, they sit at like 60, 60 degrees and 20 degrees, right? Now we are transitioning from T12 to L1. L1 sits like this, 90 and 45, right? So you're transitioning from 60, 20 to 90, 45. What it does, it, it, it increases the mobility at that segment because of a sudden change in angulation of the facets. Yeah. Another reason why you have more mobility at thoracolumbar junction is because your 11th and 12th rib are floating ribs. They don't connect. They don't connect to T12L1. Okay. They don't connect to T12L1. That's why you also have way more mobility at T12L1. Okay. 
I hope you guys know this basic biomechanics, but this is important to understand. Zarabi. Zarabi syndrome can radiate pain anywhere around the hip, lower abdomen, groin, genitals, side of the thigh, side of the hip. Okay. In 1995, because most of the most of the people from most of the literature that came out starting in 80s to early 90s, everybody, everybody was missing this diagnosis, and there was never a consensus made how to diagnose this condition. So this was a possible explanation Magne gave in 1995. Another article, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff on Magne syndrome is actually published by Robert Magne. In last three four years, there is more literature that is coming out by other pain physicians and and physiatrists. Okay. So he says that pain is rarely at thoracolumbar junction. And that's where the diagnosis is difficult because the patient comes to you, reports no symptoms at thoracolumbar junction. X-rays are normal. Second point is signs of degeneration rarely found. X-rays are normal. So you just don't look at it because patient is reporting pain in the hip, groin, side of the thigh, lower abdomen, genitals. And you're not looking at T12 L1 because X-ray doesn't show anything. And there is hardly any pain at thoracolumbar junction. And that makes the diagnosis very, very difficult. Okay. And these could be the potential symptoms. Unilateral low back pain, pain in the lateral thigh, groin pain, testicular pain, abdominal pain. These patients might have gone to a urologist, might have gone to a gynecologist, pubic bone pain, okay. aching pain that radiates go in a radiation pattern to the pubis, but, buttock pain, and trochanteric bursitis. Okay? So all these symptoms can be present in one patient, or some of them can be present if you have a T12L1 problem. Okay? And that makes the diagnosis very, very difficult because one, you don't have any symptoms at T12L1. Second, x-rays are fine. Usually, rarely you find signs of degeneration. Okay? Yeah, so your patient can have symptoms anywhere. That makes this diagnosis very challenging and very difficult. Okay. Let's understand why this is happening. Okay. So the sensory branches of T12 L1, you have like three branches. If you look at this and this article, this picture is also taken from an article written by Magne. I think the article name is a diagnostic error, Magne syndrome, because most of us miss it. So there's the anterior branch. And of course, the anterior branch will give symptoms in front of the thigh, groin, testicular region, inner thigh. Okay. Lateral branch will give you lateral pelvic pain, pain around the greater trochanter. So it will present as like trochanteric bursitis. And then you have the perforating branch, which you can see two in this. It will give you gluteal pain, iliac pain, pain around the ischium sometimes. Okay, so the idea is your patient with Magnus syndrome can present pain anywhere. Okay. Yep. Yep. Key thing is every time you're seeing a low back patient, make sure you do you do check T12 L1. I'll play a little video for you just to show how we can check the facets of T12 L1. Because we are moving from a rotational kind of spine to a flexion extension kind of spine. So you can always check rotation, rotation at T12L1 like this. Okay, just playing a little bit video. See if you find like some signs of tenderness. Okay, patient may not report a whole lot of pain, but make sure that you check T12L1. Okay, examination of facet joint. You can also do some PAs or unilateral PAs at T12L1. Okay. And that should bring on patient's symptoms. Okay. 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 Let's talk about types of Magnus syndrome. And there are two basic types of Magnus syndrome. One is a central variant. And central variant is what we were talking about, where going back to the previous picture, central variant is where you're getting compression at T12L1. Okay. And that's the central variant. And that can give you any of this. Okay, pain anywhere in the body, anywhere in the around the low back, I mean to say. Okay, and usually misdiagnosed. 
And then you have a peripheral variant where you can have entrapment around the iliac crest. And I, will, I have a lot of pictures to show you how the superior colonial nerve, which is a peripheral variant of Magnus syndrome, can cause symptoms. I have seen two or three of these, these pain, I mean, and they usually coexist with other, other problems. Patients will present pain at around iliac, iliac, iliac crest. So let me show you this, okay? So superior colonial nerve or superior colonial nerve entrapment syndrome, superior colonial nerve usually comes from T12 to L5 nerve roots, posterior MI, okay? And they move, when they move, they go inferior laterally, pierces the fracolumbar fascia and enters the pelvis. And this is where the entrapment side, you can those, see those small red circles. This is where the entrapment is. Okay. And you get your patient will present pain here on the side of the iliac crest. Okay. Okay. There is some controversy some of the medical literature does not support this kind of this kind of anatomy and this kind of presentation. But if you look at like physiatric literature, you look at pain physician literature, if you look at chiropractic literature, they talk about superior colonial nerve entrapment syndrome being a potential cause of lateral pelvic pain. Okay. An entrapment site is around the iliac crest. Okay. I'll discuss a case study with you. And I'll show you, I'll show you how, how we can address these problems. Okay. Associated factors. I think a lot of research has research and this is all recent stuff. Okay. Usually they've seen this, this problem tend to exist in older patients, superior colonial nerve, nerve entrapment syndrome. Parkinsonism is one that could cause it. If you have like, if all of us know that iliac crest is a common site where bone grafting is taken. And that can sometimes entrap the superior colonial nerve. Failed back surgery or a history of intragluteal injection can do that. Okay. Okay. This is the medial branch of superior colonial nerve. If you want to learn more about Magnus syndrome, I think there is a systemic review by Randhava. I think he's a physiatrist too. It's a very, very fascinating article because it talks about various things. I think he works at University of Toronto, and I mean some some of the some of the research done by him is fascinating, and this article is absolutely magnificent because I think that is this is the only systemic review that is present for Magnus syndrome. Okay. okay, so let's see how it looks like again. So this is how the superior colonial nerve comes out. Okay, it pierces the thoracolumbar fascia, enters the lateral pelvis, and this is where it gets entrapped somewhere. Okay, you can see that black black star. Okay, and they say it's like seven centimeters from the midline. So this is where it gets entrapped, and you can have symptoms on the lateral pelvis. Okay. Yeah, I want to talk about this because this is important because superior cranial nerve patients present like very 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 distinctly than other patients. So patients will. If you have to find the exact site of pain of superior colonial nerve entrapment, your patient is in a prone position, right? You draw a line on the posterior iliac crest and where you find the center, that's where the symptoms are. So you can see that cross, okay? And this, this article is published by Mizumoto. You can see how recent the study is, 2022. It's just a case report, but what he did was he found the exact pain site gave the patient a lidocaine injection, was able to fix the symptoms right away. Yeah. And because, the, because it is very close to iliac crest, it can actually be confused with kidney pain. Okay. So the site of the pain is very distinct. The patient tells you that I hurt here on the middle of my iliac crest, posterior iliac crest. That's your superior colonial nerve entrapment right there. Okay. And you can also have numbness and tingling because it's a cutaneous nerve. You can sometimes have burning dysthesias. They'll present with burning types of sign. You usually have absence of neurological signs. In certain patients, they found that you can do a tunnel and you can reproduce symptoms. And you'll do the tunnel around this cross. Okay. So basically you draw a line on the posterior iliac crest 
and the center of the posterior iliac crest is is where the symptoms are okay okay let's because we are talking about superior cluniae now we're going to just talk about the mid inferior and middle entrapments are not very common both of them come from s1 to s3 superior comes from t12 to l4 or sometimes certain situations t12 to l5 and you can see middle cluniae nerve can give you symptoms in the middle buttock and inferior cluniae can give you symptoms in the inferior article by tresca talks more about it if you want to read read up on it the middle cluniae nerve so talking about middle cluniae nerve entrapment under long dorsal ligament all the si dysfunctions can cause long dorsal ligament to be taut right if and if you're seeing patients with medial buttock pain always think about middle middle cluniae nerve because most of the si dysfunctions will give you some hypertonicity or some tension increased tension in the long dorsal ligament so this middle cluniae can get entrapped and give you medial medial buttock symptoms okay talking about inferior cluniae it usually gets entrapped under piriformis or under ischian especially it's, it's called sitting entrapment both middle cluniae and inferior cluniae are, are not as common as superior cluniae but we should probably know about it i think this is a great picture to remember because of the nerve supply we don't talk much about cutaneous nerves but they can be they can be pain generators and we're going to talk about a case report i think you will see how 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 important it is to actually understand this diagnosis okay just to show you another picture okay you can see superior cluniae nerve supplying the lateral portion of the pelvis and then this is the middle cluniae okay and this is the inferior cluniae you can read the article by kerry another very recent article okay supplying the portion of the ischium okay so the when you're finding patients with pelvic pain make sure that you are aware about cluniae nerves and, and the root value and where they get entrapped because this will help you 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 will only treat stuff which you only which you know about that's what i say okay we're going to talk about the case study but uh, first but dr steve do you want to add anything here dr steve you there no i don't have anything to add so far okay 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 let's talk about this case study and this is a fascinating patient i mean just absolutely fascinating patient means because the patient has suffered and patient has suffered and the diagnosis is very very complex and i mean when you see complex patients actually i think it's fun just because you can you can address things which people fail where people fail so so this patient was a 44 year old male african american presented with right lateral iliac pain with symptoms radiating to the groin so lateral thigh pain pain going to the groin testicular region lower abdomen and lateral thigh for past two years patient was a cop police officer and basically it affected his personal he was very very frustrated because he saw a urologist a surgeon primary physician pain physician but nothing helped okay he had a neurolysis to the superficial peroneal nerve perineal nerve done if you know the superficial perineal nerve is a branch of pudendal nerve and even the and it supplies the your scrotal area so even neurolysis did not resolve the symptoms when he saw me he was consulting a pain management physician and a psychologist when you see a patient seeing a psychologist you know that the patient the pain has basically controlled patient's life okay okay so these are my findings and if you want to read about more about this patient i think there is a study we published a couple of years ago we'll share that article with you so every time a patient comes in i we do a lumbar pelvic exam and patient had right sitting flexion positive right sacral base prominent so point to sit people who are new to this lecture i'll try to explain all these findings and dr 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 steve can jump into so and had restriction in t12 l1 l1 l2 L in extension and right side bending the symptoms are on the right side same 
restrictions on the right side. The key thing here is going back to Magna 1980 and Magna 1995, this patient is not reporting any thoracolumbar pain. Okay. Pain, no pain at the site of dysfunction, which makes this diagnosis very, very hard. So the idea here is if you see any patients, make sure you assess the transitional zone T12 L1 every time. It's important to treat T12 L1 every time you see a patient with hip pain, buttock pain, SI pain, groin pain, testicular pain, any of the any of those categories, make sure that you're not missing T12 L1. Because according to Magne, 40% of his sample size of 350 had thoracolumbar problems or secondary thoracolumbar problems. Okay. Supine to sit was short to short and some pubic dysfunction as well on the right side. Okay. My evaluation was he had a little bit of a pelvic inflare. People who have attended our lectures before, they know how to assess pelvic inflare. Supine to sit was short to short. Okay. You can also you can also measure it from your sternum to your ASIS on either side, and that distance should be less. Okay. Then you can, the patient also had unilateral sacral extension, had restriction in T12 L1, L1, L2. We're going to work on all these things if you want to address this patient. So, okay. Any questions so far? Because so I'll be going a little fast here. Any questions so far? Yeah. Any questions so far? Okay. I'm not seeing any questions, so I'll probably move forward. We're going to talk about a little bit about the treatment techniques. We're going to address if you know about our pelvic lecture, if you have attended the pelvic lecture before, we always treat the pubis first. Okay. So you stand on the opposite side and you do a resisted hip flexion. This looks like a Thomas stretch test. Okay. And you hold for like six seconds, repeat three to four times. Dr. Ford, can you demonstrate this on yourself? I know you don't have somebody there, but do you mind demonstrating? I know you're in the clinic. Yes. Okay. Do you mind demonstrating this on yourself? Just a, just a resisted hip flexion in like Thomas stretch position is what you're trying to do, trying to correct. So basically, this is what you're doing. You're resisting the hip flexion. And you're trying to address the pubis because you always treat the secondary dysfunctions. Okay. Yeah. And then this is the primary dysfunction, thoracolumbar manipulation. You can either do it in sitting or side lying. Patient cradles the bed. You come around, you try to keep your pisiform ar around the spinous process. You can add a little bit of side bending and rotation and then you can do a thrust. Okay. Another secondary dysfunction was unilateral sacral MET was done. Very, very straightforward technique. Yes, we should, we always treat the pubis dysfunction first before addressing anything. That's the treatment sequence we usually follow, even if it's a secondary dysfunction. It, when your patient has multiple segmental dysfunctions, it, it's hard to sometimes say which is primary, which is secondary. But if, it, if the problems have migrated to T12L1 and patient has pain everywhere, this, def, this patient definitely falls into the category of Magnus syndrome because he's reporting pain everywhere, like lower abdomen, 
groin, lateral thigh, lateral hip, posterior thigh, so posterior hip. Yeah. And then you can do this MET. Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Ford, do you mind showing this MET yeah. on like on a, on a skeleton or something? Jab somebody? Yeah. So sure, because sure. this is a very handy MET and I see unilateral sacral extension all the time in the clinic with severe symptoms. Okay. So. Yes, the just show us what unilateral sacral extension is. And then, so pelvic inflare and unilateral sacral extension seems to coexist. You diagnose pelvic inflare by checking supine to sit is usually short to short like a pelvic upslip. And then you, if you palpate the SI sacral, sacral base, you or ILA both will be prominent because you're just getting that extension. Okay. And Dr. Steve will show you this, how this will present. So in unilateral sacral extension, usually the base of the sacrum, which is at the top here, the base of the sacrum, right? This is the apex of the sacrum, the ILA. Here's the base. So the base of the sacrum will be very prominent on the affected side and it'll be exquisitely tender and painful. And basically the, this part of the sacrum is very prominent in relation to the innominate bone or the pelvic bone here. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna hold the front of the pelvic bone, have the patient push down into my hand, which is ultimately creating a posterior force on the pelvic bone and then we're going to push on the sacral base, which is basically creating an anterior force on the prominent base of the sacrum. So this is what it would look like. Right. One hand underneath ASIS. The other hand is going to come here and push on the base of the sacrum. And we're trying to shear the base of the sacrum forwards. And it is a muscle energy technique. So we'll have the patient engaging their pelvis to try to push their pelvis down into the mat while we push sacral base anteriorly. Yep. So this is this is a secondary dysfunction. You also have to address this. And then I have a habit of doing SI manipulations every time. I feel like I've fixed something. You just end that with SI manipulation. This is a self technique where you do both things together. You block the sacrum and you pull the leg by holding the patient's ankle between your thighs. Okay. Long axis distraction, distraction manipulation. You patient is in patient's hip is in abduction, internal rotation and extension. And do you do a quick thrust. Okay. I'm going to go back to a couple of slides again. So just to, just to emphasize a few more, few more points here. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about this, okay? So a little bit about differential diagnosis, just because I feel this will help you understand this diagnosis better. Okay, can, can you guys give me some potential diagnosis where patient will have unilateral low back pain? One side, what, 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 other differential diagnosis can give you unilateral low back pain. Yeah. Number of the facet dysfunction, SI joint dysfunction. Any more answers, guys? Facet away strain, meniscoid pain. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, all these are correct. QL strain. A visceral problem can also give you unilateral low back pain. So, and that's why this diagnosis is difficult just because proxydynia piriformis syndrome. Okay. Yep. Let's talk about growing pain. What other di what diagnosis can give you growing pain? Hip away, for sure. Guys, try to jump in and try to answer this. I mean, every sacral torsion can give you groin pain. 
AVN of GT, pubic dysfunction. What else can give you groin pain? Bursitis, adductor muscle strain. That's that was that was the answer I was looking for. Actually, that was good. Strain adductors, AVN, muscular strain of it. So, and that's that's why this diagnosis is so difficult. Just because you have pain at various sides, and you're come all of you are coming up with like various various different diagnoses. Okay, let's talk a little bit about abdominal, lower abdominal pain. What diagnosis can give you lower abdominal pain? Give me some, some diagnosis which, which can give you lower abdominal pain, one-sided lower abdominal pain. From appendix, good. What else? Renal stone, yeah. Kidney stone. Hernia. The idea is that whenever we talk about abdominal pain, we never relate it to, relate it to musculoskeletal, right? We always, if a patient comes to you with abdominal pain, we always think this is, has to be systemic. Any GI issues can give you lower abdominal pain. Diaphragm dysfunction, SI joint dysfunction. Yep. We, we never we never consider abdominal pain as a musculoskeletal problem gallstones gastritis hernia so many iliosaurus issues so many so many you can be lower cross syndrome low doses good good okay let's talk about let's talk about pubic bone pain pain around the pubis so this is interesting just because this patient was the patient I we discussed was also been to a urologist because they were just so confused, all of them. Because when pain starts to radiate to the soft tissue regions, you don't tend to think that it's coming from musculoskeletal. So any differential diagnosis for pubic bone pain or around the pubic area, male or female? Adductor strain could be one. Pubic dysfunction is pubic fractures, you know, bladder dysfunction, adductor strain, yes, nerve damage, pelvic shift. Especially in females, all the gynecological issues can give you pubic bone pain, right? So symphysis pubis dysfunction is proteal rectus abdominal strain, gynecological issue, yes. And that's why this, this diagnosis is challenging just because it, it, it hurts everywhere and you're trying to, thracolumbar junction is the last thing you would think of when you see this patient. Pelvic, pelvic inflammatory disease is a good answer. Okay. Okay, let's talk about uh, lateral hip pain or lateral pelvic pain. Any? Bursitis is a rubbish diagnosis, we know. So, can, can you give me differential diagnosis for lateral hip pain? Gluteal tendinopathy, TFL strain, gluteus. I'm not sure about gluteal amnesia. Weakness of PGM, that's a good answer. Lateral pelvic pain, myalgia parasthetica. That's the answer I was looking for. So I think one of the articles, Magne also called this syndrome as pseudo, pseudo myalgia parasthetica. So patient can have pseudo visceral pain or pseudo myalgia parasthetica. That's a good answer. Yep. So the idea here is I'm, I'm doing this activity so that you understand that these three branches can radiate pen pain everywhere. 
and the superior superior cluneal nerve entrapment can cause pain in the lateral pelvis lateral aspect thigh absolutely very very good guys this is important this is this, this activity was important because you guys were able to find various differential diagnoses every time you will see a patient with this kind of presentation you would not miss t12 l1 okay so going to show this video one more time just a rotational assessment of t12 l1 patient is in side lying and you go checking you definitely check a segment above segment below you check t12 l1 t11 t12 and l1 l2 just maybe make sure that you check a segment above and segment below okay and if a patient shows present with this kind of presentation and some tenderness at with palpation or segmental mobility testing i think you always treat t12 l1 i always treat t12 l1 in most of my patients who present with low back pain anyways but you definitely treat t12 l1 okay okay talking a little bit about superior gluteal nerve you can superior superior cluneal nerve lateral pelvic pain make sure that you're always always thinking about this diagnosis in lateral pelvic pain and the pain site is usually in the posterior center of the posterior iliac crest okay discuss this uh dr ford any any patient you want to discuss here any patient you saw no but these are not that uncommon and it's like we always it's like we always say you know, this diagnosis has probably seen you you might not have seen it right or there's patients running around with these kinds of symptoms that are not getting treated properly and i think it's important for you know in the united states as therapists we go and visit our doctors close by so I don't know about you guys if you could do the marketing and stuff like that and physicians I'm sure are just as busy there as they are here and it's very difficult to see physicians and to to talk to them and to see their front office staff but in the USA we find out okay at this doctor's office you know who's the person in charge of referring patients to physical therapy or recommending physical therapy and then we want to talk to that person and get to know them um so i don't know about marketing in india i think if you have your own clinic it becomes more and more important to you know speak with doctors offices to drop off cards pamphlets flyers you know have a social media presence all that kind of thing but if you want to you know grow your clinic and grow your market share um you know spending some time talking to physicians that might see patients that might not otherwise go to physical therapy because these patients are going to go probably see urologists and different kinds of doctors like that and they may never come to physical therapy and so someone's got to be out there to educate these docs like hey if you ever get someone with these kinds of symptoms you know please give physical therapy a try um you know give us a couple of sessions to see if we can change their pain this is something that we can fix i don't know that's how we go about it in the USA but um yeah for sure you know yeah i mean i think this is a hard diagnosis because this talking specifically about this patient patient has been to almost all possible sub specialties so supine to sit was short to short when we when we are looking at supine to sit patient is in supine position patient sits up it was short to begin with on the affected side and it's still short the interpretation usually is a up slip or pelvic inflare upslips usually don't cause any sacral dysfunctions inflares usually have like unilateral sacral extension and we did this yes please all right all right so <clears throat> patient's laying supine okay and then they sit up right so if it's short to short like dr singh was saying the hip bone can be upslip so one hip bone can be jammed up in which case when the patient is laying down the leg will appear to be shorter and when they sit up the leg will still appear to be shorter the other thing that can happen is inflare and outflare 
where this um, innominate bone flares inwards, okay? If this flares inwards, that makes for a short to short as well, just like an out flare when the pelvic bone flares outwards, the leg will appear long to long. And these are commonly combined with other, other diagnoses because this is, this is a system, this is a predictable system. And if it does this, then we'll also see this, this, this. If it does that, then we also expect to see this, this, this. And this kind of stuff is super complicated, super complex. But our SI course is, I think, the best one in the world in terms of understanding how to go about diagnosing, assessing, and stuff like that. It's one of our offline courses. And in fact, it's going to be, we are in the process right now of getting it uh, accredited as a continuing education course in the United States. And Dr. Singh and I will be teaching this in, in the USA, hopefully in several different cities before the end of the year. Um, so if you want to know more about SI stuff, we're your guys, you know, tune into us. You can listen online and then hopefully join us for an in-person, um, you know, workshop later this year in India, we intend on coming. So it's complicated, but it's very interesting. And I would say if you're going to treat, man, if you're treating low backs or below, if you're treating anything lower than the low back, you need to know how to assess and treat the SI area, the pelvic girdle. Yep. So, uh, I mean, uh I cannot stress on this enough. And me and Dr. Steve always talks about this outside this class. I'm currently seeing a patient who's seen like, this guy has seen like 10 different, he's been doing like a clinic shopping for last 10 years and nothing has helped him. And I think it is funny, but not funny just because this guy has probably seen every PT in Austin, Texas. Spent a and lot I'm of money. Gonna, I've spent a lot of money. And... <laughs> He says he doesn't care about money because the problem has not been resolved. And the patient had unilateral sacral extension as a diagnosis. And finally, we are able to get some resolution to his symptoms. But it's important. That's why it's important to know this complexity and important to understand that these things exist. Because if you want to be an expert in something, you need to know finer details. You can't be an expert if you don't you don't know about diagnosis. You can't, you, you will only treat stuff if you know about it. That's what, that's what I would say. And unilateral stuff, like especially unilateral sacral stuff is complex, but once you know about it, you've seen it enough. It's not that hard. Anything you want to uh, add Dr. Dr. Ford about unilateral stuff? Cause you no, see that in the, all the time, right? Yep. Yep. So, Okay. Any more questions, guys? I know this was a very short lecture, but I mean, I still feel that this is a very important information because even if you treat one of you are successfully able to treat one patient who had Magnus syndrome or symptoms sim similar to Magnus syndrome or superior colonial nerve entrapment, I think this lecture was worth it. Just one patient. <laughs> Any more questions, guys? I think we'll stick around for five more minutes for your questions. Uh, since the neural moment. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining in. Um, we're starting our first cohort, you guys, uh, in March. So I'm not sh currently, I'm not sure what like specials or discounts are running currently, but check it out. We're very competitively priced. And I mean, more important than the pricing and the numbers and stuff like that, we want some quality PTs who are interested in learning more and growing as therapists and potentially growing with us as GEM. You know, the, the therapists that come on board with us, you know, we're going to encourage them and want them to potentially consider doing our fellowship, per, our fellowship portion. And we're hoping that out of the cohort, you know, we've got some mentors applying up front um, that we're going to train and work with to potentially become people who are teachers, who house students for GEM and stuff like that. But we're also hoping that within the cohort of people that are applying, if we find some talented therapists, some skilled therapists, some therapists that are good with their hands and stuff like that, or maybe, or maybe they're terrible at the beginning, but by the end, they've really grown and developed that we can handpick some PTs who are going to be able to join us 
and uh, do some teaching with us, house students with us. So we're really looking to create the next generation of top, top um, physiotherapists. Um, so you guys consider joining our cohort, you know, try out a couple courses or or sign up for the whole thing at the discounted rate. But we look forward to seeing you guys some more. I know we've got a lecture next weekend. Dr. Singh, you said we're doing shoulder next weekend. We're doing periarthritic shoulder. It's a very common diagnosis. Cool. So I think there are a couple of questions. I just want to clarify. Yeah. People are asking, how long does it take to... I, I feel like when you start treating the problem, your patients will right away know that you're treating the right thing. Because patients can tell you touched my pain. It might not be 100% on the day one. It might be 20, 30, 40% on day one. But in like three or four sessions, even like neural issues, cutaneous nerve issues, you'll be able to, because nerves get angry and ischemic. And once you relieve that, yeah. Once you relieve that pressure and relieve that dysfunction, underlying dysfunction, they usually do well. Cutaneous nerves can also regenerate. We know that. Yeah. Right? So once you relieve that pressure, usually patients do fine. So it shouldn't take long if you're treating the problem. That's the most important thing. Another question I have, yes, you will get, yes, you will get all the information and all the lectures. If you do this course again, you can definitely attend it again. Okay. Other question. Any more questions, guys? I mean, we'll probably put this lecture on YouTube and you guys can go and look at it. But this is a very, very important diagnosis. Just because knowing that this exists is, is everything, I think. Because, yeah, if you, if you don't know that something like this can exist and can give you symptoms, you won't be treating it. And thoracolumbar problems, I see it every now and then. It's not like the most common diagnosis I treat, but I see every now and then. Any specific articles you can suggest? I think the best article I've found, it's not written by a PT. Actually, there are very few. You can look at Randhawa 2022. I will share that article on the group. You can also look at articles by Magne. I think they're kind of old, 1980, 1995, 1997. There's an article in 2005. But if you look at Randhawa's article, it gives you a lot of information, like a lot of information. But the problem, problem with these researchers is that they don't talk about from physiotherapy standpoint. And that's where I think we can fill the gaps. I will share the article that was published by me, which we, where I discuss treatment, how you should address that. Because most of these articles talk about the problem, but very few manual therapy articles are written on Magnus syndrome, where it talks about how Changing the mechanics of the pelvis, changing the mechanics of thoracolumbar junction can actually help you help you resolve those symptoms. I will definitely share both the articles on the group right now. Okay. Which book to follow for this uncommon? I think I would look at literature. I think we have gone past that stage where we look at books for diagnosis because I think books are not updated for, especially for something like this, for uncommon diagnosis, something like this. Because more and more research are come, more and more research is coming out in Magnus syndrome. I mean, I think more most of the research came out in like last two, three years. I mean, I think most of the articles I shared in the last three years, apart from the Magnus and Magnus primary articles. So I'll share the three or four good articles related to Magnus syndrome. Definitely article by Randhawa, because I learned a lot from that reading that article, just because some of the information is. It is from the medical standpoint, but it's very, very important for us to understand and treat this diagnosis because these patients will be missed by urologists, missed by pain yeah. physicians, missed by, unless they hit the right nerve or they hit the right, treat the right dysfunction, this, these patients will continue to suffer. And they're around you, they'll see you at some point. Yeah. Yes, yes. Just fixing the TL junction and treating the secondary dysfunctions. <laughs> treating the secondary dysfunctions are important. <clears throat> that's why we always emphasize on regional interdependence, treating the pelvis, treating, the, treating, the, treating the pubis, treating the hip. Dr. Singh, would you like me to go ahead and demonstrate like a, f a couple of exercises that you might give the patient either in clinic or that they would do at home by themselves, like for lumbar input? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Maybe absolutely. some lumbar thoracic flexibility exercises yeah yeah please do that yes absolutely all right
what would you try what would you do i would work on lower thra- uh, low, l- lumbar thoracic or thoracic lumbar mobility stuff maybe okay. like in quadruped position okay so quadruped yeah quadruped position or like prone position i can i can do like some thoracic lumbar rotation okay so okay guys um you know you're welcome to stay tuned in. We're going to go and just demonstrate a couple of exercises that we would give the patient to do in clinic and potentially give the patient at home. And so the logical flow of what we normally do is for me and for Dr. Singh too, I think we want to start at the joints at the bony structure and then work our way out. So we're going to take care of the bones, the joint restrictions, the, 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 the pelvis, the lumbar spine, right? Do manipulations, METs, mobilizations, joint work, done. Okay. So now we've taken care of the problem. Okay. And now we need to give input to the other tissues. So maybe there are some holding patterns. Maybe there's some muscle hypertonicity. Maybe there are some muscles that are inhibited. Okay. Uh, maybe the patient has a posture problems. Um, and certainly if there's been ischemia or hypoxia to some nerves, you know, movement, blood flow, heat, circulation, um, cardio exercise, which will increase global circulation and oxygenation to the tissues. You know, these are some concepts that are going to be very helpful. And so if we just look at the, the problem, which was the thoracolumbar junction, right, there's several problems. But on day one, we're just going to start with the most basic local problem, which even though the patient's having groin and thigh pain, the problem is at the thoracolumbar junction. And so we would want to give some input to the spine, some flexibility, mobility exercises to the spine. So what are some things that we could do? We could do some cat-cow, right? There's some mobility exercises. We could do some threading the needle. And the names might be different in different parts of the world, but we could do some threading the needle, right? Do that on both sides. Guys, there's upper trunk rotations. Rotate back, rotate back, rotate back. When the patient gets as far as they can, take a deep breath, breathe out, and then come back. We could do that a couple of times. We could even do some McKinsey extensions. We could do that in standing or we could do it in prone. Right? We could do this. It's non specific, but it will give input to the thoracolumbar junction. You would want to you would want to check with the patient and just see if extension or flexion increases or decreases their pain. Don't just give an exercise. You need to monitor the, the results of that exercise. And uh, we are going to assume that any input is going to be good input, but, you know, repeated extension or repeated flexion could potentially increase the patient's pain. If it does, that gives us useful information. So there's repeated extension. Could do child's pose, open up the neural foramen, decompress the back. Right. There's many other exercises that you can do for thoracolumbar mobility, but those are just some examples, you know? And if I found one or several of those that the patient says to me, that feels good, because I'm asking them, okay, let's do, let's do 10 of these. Tell me how it feels. Oh, that feels really bad. But then as they do it, oh, that's kind of loosening up. That feels better. Great. The patient understands how this exercise will be beneficial. Do this one at home. Patient's doing an exercise, and after five reps, they say, oh, it's hurting. After 10 reps, it's hurting more. We're not doing that exercise today. We'll come back to it. I want to know what's going on, but for today, I just want to give you two or three stretches, exercises that you can do at home to help out the process of feeling better. And when you deal with these kind of diagnoses, these kind of nerve impingements and stuff like that, like Dr. Singh said, it doesn't take long. I would typically say it takes about as long to treat as a, as a benign paroxysmal positional vertigo patient. One to three sessions. One to three sessions. Maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, but um, that's my expectation. If I get a patient with this diagnosis, my expectation is probably in three visits, this patient's going to be feeling great. 
but but coming back to the same point you will only treat stuff which you know about it there is very yeah. little literature people don't discuss this not taught in elementary education i didn't even know about it when i graduated pt school about this stuff so that's why programs are programs we are doing are bridging a gap like lectures like this bridge the gap from your elementary education to advanced education because these patients are seeing you you're just not recognizing them these patients are coming to your clinic every day so every second day we just have to pick pick these ideas clinical pearls and start start incorporating in your practice and that's how you will become an expert okay so okay for everyone for everyone that participated in today's lecture for everyone that's for everybody that's listening right now if you guys are interested in joining us you know we're doing these free lectures to to show up, to show you guys what we're doing, what we're offering, the level at which we're teaching and stuff like that. And keep in mind, this is just a one hour lecture. And so our our full courses will demonstrate a lot more techniques and exercises. Um, a lot more, you know, that's obviously going to be the bulk of it and stuff and stuff like that. But if you guys think that you want to sign up for our for our stuff um, for the next 48 hours, from right now, we're going to run a 30% off of our online modules, and that's for the whole program. Um, and we'll be coming to India. For the people that do our online modules, we'll also have at least two um, intensive workshops where we cover the lab portion for all of our modules, which includes manual therapy, muscle energy techniques, mobilizations, manipulations. Um, and manipulations are basically osteopathic techniques. It looks like chiropractic stuff, but the philosophy is different. The philosophy is different. Um, dry needling, you know, all the hands-on stuff. Um, so we encourage you guys to join us. We encourage you guys to try us out, um, sign up and stuff like that. I think there's a couple of in America, in the whole world, in India, wherever you are, there's always like trends. There's always like fads, like this thing comes out and now it's so popular and this thing comes out and now it's so popular. And I got to say that in physical therapy, we're not immune to this. And so we we find all these alternative medicines and this guy's teaching this approach and this guy's teaching this approach and this guy's doing fascial distortion and this guy's teaching uh, chiropractic techniques and this one's doing hijama cupping and all of these things. And what we're trying to teach is an eclectic approach. So we're going to talk about Mulligan. Where does where do we put it? We're going to talk about McKinsey. Where do we put it? We're going to do um, joint work, manipulations, mobilizations, popping, cracking things. But it's from an osteopathic perspective. That's medicine. Okay, chiropractic perspective is different. Yes, they can pop stuff. You know, popping stuff is a party trick. You can walk up to somebody and pop their back. Cool. But the difference is. Generally speaking, the chiropractic philosophy is that all diseases in the human body, including diabetes and liver problems and cancer, come from a malalignment of the spine. Okay, This is the origin of chiropractic. We do not teach that because we know that's not true. Osteopathic medicine says there are medical conditions that are separate from joint dysfunction and tissue dysfunction. Okay, And so we're teaching the osteopathic approach. It's not the chiropractic approach. The other difference is, at least in America, chiropractors want to pop their patients and send them home and pop their patient and send them home. And the patient is not educated. They're not trained. They're not empowered to take care of their own problem. And as physiotherapists, we want to do the manual therapy and the exercises but we don't want our patients to become reliant on us. We want to empower them and educate them and come alongside them because I don't want the patient to feel like they cannot fix themselves. I don't want the patient to have this dependency. Now I get from a business standpoint, you want them to maybe be dependent on you, but not like that. That's not what physiotherapy is about. Physiotherapy is about getting our patients better and getting them back to life and not having them come once a week for their, for their whole life, because at some point that becomes a sham, right? At some point that becomes a sham. And so here at GEM, that's kind of the philosophy. That's the approach that we take. You know, our education here in the USA is eclectic. We learn about everything, Mulligan, McKinsey, fascia, this, that, everything. And then we have evidence-based research. You know, we have research studies that show 
when do we do different things? In this particular diagnosis, we do this, 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 and then use your clinical reasoning for other things. In this diagnosis, we do this, 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 and then we use clinical reasoning to maybe incorporate some other things because every patient is different, okay? Every patient is different. But um, yeah, I hope that you guys will join us. I hope that you guys will sign up. Um, we really enjoyed having you guys today. Um, any other questions, we'll field them now for the last five minutes or so. Thank you so much. We'll be sharing the quiz just to test yourself on, on social media, just, just to test yourself whether how much you learned from this session. This is a complex stuff, but I think we enjoy teaching this stuff because I feel like this, this is this is going to add to your information, you all what you already know. And I mean, yeah. yeah. So yeah, we'll stick around for five more minutes for your questions. And then, and then I think we'll probably sign off. Yeah, you guys feel free to sign off. If y'all are done, you can sign off. If you've got more questions, you can hang out for a little bit. We'll answer them one at a time. If you have any questions, any questions related to Jam and our cohort that we're starting very soon, um, we'll field those to, um, I guess we can field those now or get those over to Dr. Jrumi. Okay. We'll be sharing the quiz in the next five minutes. Please do attempt the quiz. I think that it's just testing yourself how how much you learn from this. And if you get get an answer wrong, that's fine. You just you can always look at the right answers and stuff. And so it's always good to test yourself. Dr. Singh, if any of our um, listeners have a complex patient that they want to discuss with us, either on like WhatsApp or maybe even live video, is that something? Is that something that's possible? Why not? Yeah, I mean, we always. I mean, yeah, you can always communicate with us. I mean, there is always WhatsApp is great. I mean, you can always do a WhatsApp video chat if you want to do it. I mean, yeah. An option. I mean, I think that's how you learn by discussing with people, learning new right. stuff, applying right. on patients. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, mean, I think you should, as long as you're curious and excited about learning, you'll always learn something. That's what I, I think. So. Dr. Singh, I saw the email that GEM has been incorporated into the U.S. Nice. Yes. Nice, right? Yeah. Nice, nice. Yes. yes. All right. Well, it's it's okay. quiet. So I think the questions have been answered. Uh, which is effective sitting or lying? I don't think there is any difference. I mean, you can do either or as long as you're targeting the right segment. You, I mean, you as long as you're targeting the right segment, you can do either or. I've, I've done both. I mean, pe people have preferences, but I've done both. I mean, you can use either or. It doesn't. As long as I feel like as long as you're treating the right thing, you'll find yeah. the result. Even if your man manipulation is not the best, but if you're treating the right segment, Mm -hmm. But if you're not even addressing T12 L1, I think you're not going to fix that patient. That's that's the bottom line. So that's why learning learning techniques is fine. I mean, you will. In, I'm not good with certain techniques, or Doctor Steve might be great at certain techniques. But it's about learning the clinical reasoning. I mean, if you learn the clinical reasoning, what to do, when, how to how to address that problem, you'll probably be good at it. Yeah. I think treating. Yeah. I think. Yeah. We, we get excited about turn, learning dry needling and manipulations and mobilizations and techniques and stuff. But I think if you want to be like effective and efficient expert therapist, your clinical reasoning should be short shot that this is what I'm treating. I know this is what it is. Yeah. And in certain patients, like if I, I'm treating a 500 pound patient and I'm trying to address T12 L1 and actually this is a real case scenario. I was, I had a 500 pound patient massive patient, I had to address a T12L1 
my first time i did it i couldn't even move the segment but <laughs> i mean but on three four attempts i was able to get his symptoms down but but still the idea is that you're treating the right segment if you're not even right. treating 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 the right segment you're not going to fix that patient no ma'am clonial nerve cannot be found on an mri the only that's why it's missed it's, it cannot be found it's it's a yes so and that's why clinical would dry needling help in superior you can you can definitely try some soft tissue some dry needling i would try some soft tissue some dry needling but definitely address t12 l1 i always believe that and you can you can guys can disagree with me i always believe that dry needling as a modality is useless if it's used alone it's great when it is combined with other stuff because if you just needle anything i mean yes it can give you some inflammatory markers in that area some metabolites but you have to combine with your mobilizations combine with your treatment combine with your corrective exercises yeah you can definitely do some soft tissue work if you're finding because it's a cutaneous nerve it can definitely get entrapped under a, a tight hypertonic muscle and you can needle that muscle yeah you can probably needle the paraspinal squamous lumborum you can probably needle multifidus in certain situations yeah you can you can definitely work on that but it's about making that clinical reasoning having that bullet points that these are the dysfunctions this patient has and treating and addressing those dysfunctions and then you can also combine it with your soft tissue work yep i guess that is it i think the quiz is up so please do attempt the quiz i think that will give you an idea on how much you learned if you get an answer wrong that's perfectly fine you'll still get the certificate it's about learning process and we'll probably keep bringing these lectures for you so that we can keep adding more information people for people who will sign up for the program or for people who don't sign up for the program we want you to continue learning mm-hmm. and through this process of getting more information <clears throat> recent research yeah. recent ideas yeah. i think our courses been... no go ahead do we enjoy adding more stuff because i mean I I think I published a paper on Magnus syndrome a year ago and I now I look at the literature there is more stuff that has been added. So yeah. and I think this is a continuous process if you want to keep up with this learning process I think you definitely should do the program and definitely should at least yeah. attend our course. Yeah. The courses are great <clears throat> in isolation but the idea behind it is that you know if you go to one course for one weekend or one workshop it's really hard to apply everything that you learn and and adopt the philosophy of those of of that course into your into education and training but the purpose of something like this like what we're offering is is modules that build on each other that grow on each other is that it's not just going to be a couple of techniques or 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 pieces of information that that help you it's it's a whole approach it's a whole way of viewing how we evaluate and treat patients it builds on itself there is going to be some overlap course to course and so there's built in review there's built in you know practice uh and, and and learning of different exercises techniques um the clinical reasoning behind them and stuff like that and it's it it it's really designed to bring everything together so that by the end of the cohort it's not just all this dis disjunct information it kind of brings everything together and all of a sudden you're like you know have this aha moment and it all comes together um so you know the courses are great in, in indiv- individually but way way better way more synergistic and stuff like that as a whole which is why that's what we're recommending but of course you know we're happy to have you guys for any of the lectures that you care to attend so anyways we look forward to seeing you guys around thanks have a good night